topic today is living our destiny. Living our destiny as Seventh-day Adventists. I'm glad to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Not because you have to be a Seventh-day Adventist to be right with God. Not because you have to be a Seventh-day Adventist in order to be saved. No, that's not what it's about. There are many, many Christians on this earth. We have always believed the vast majority of God's people are elsewhere. Why am I happy to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Because I believe that God has chosen this people for a unique destiny, a unique role in His work on this earth. And so I want to talk with you this week, beginning this morning, about who we are and why we are here. Adventist identity. In the past, Adventist identity has tended to be a negative thing. In other words, we decided who we are based upon who we're not. Adventists knew, well, we're not Catholic, and we're not Protestant, we're not Jewish, and definitely not Muslim, and so on. And so we sort of carved out a place for ourselves over against others. The problem is that type of idea isn't adequate by itself in today's world. Let me illustrate. I had the chance a few years back to take a tour group to the land of Turkey. Turkey's a wonderful country. Very, very interesting place with some wonderful ruins to visit. Old cities from back in Bible times. We visited the, the uh, land of the seven churches. Uh, walked over the ground of Laodicea, which is just a big farmer's field today with all kinds of stone under your feet and things like that. One small problem. I don't know if it was something we ate in Turkey or something we ate in Egypt just before we got to Turkey, but the first day in Turkey, everyone in our group got sick. And it was one of those rolling sicknesses, you know what I mean? Somebody in the front sneezes and everybody in the back catches it. And then the people in front get well and the people in the back sneeze and pass it back to the front of the bus. Have you ever, ever been on a trip like that? 37 health-reforming Seventh-day Adventist Christians traveling with two chain-smoking Muslims who never got sick the whole week. That's health reform for you. That's a real witness. I know how you feel if you've ever been through that. I'll tell you. Ten solid days of sickness. It was miserable. We got back to Jerusalem where our group was based uh, during that uh, time of teaching. And our group was pondering these issues of Adventist identity. Who are we? Why, why does it matter? We remembered, for example, that, that during this trip we were miserable to live with. We were snapping at each other, snapping at the driver, snapping at the Muslim guide, and, and so on and so on. You know, just a really great witness, you know? And uh, we got to a place that used to be called Philadelphia, brotherly love. And you know what? The Turkish people were so fantastic. I remember one time I was walking by a stand, a vegetable stand, and a, and a man comes and motions to me, come over here, take my picture. Well, in Egypt, I knew what that meant. You know, you take picture from me, I take money from you. So, you know, I wasn't too enthusiastic about this. Go, 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 come, come. He seemed kind of nice. So I took a picture of him in his vegetable stand. And when I was done taking the picture, he said, wait, wait. And he gathered up an armload of vegetables from his stand and handed them to me and thanked me for taking a picture of his vegetable stand. And then we went to eat at a little place where they had the most incredible cheese bread with herbs, you know, big piles of herbs. We were eating this most fantastic tasting stuff we ever had. And we spent five U.S. dollars feeding eight people. And we were thinking, wow, this is great. We need to leave a nice gratuity behind. And I left about 25% of the bill as a thank you to the man for giving that wonderful meal to us. Went back to the bus. A little while later, a couple other members of our group came with a whole nother meal. He was so thankful for the tip, he wasn't willing to let them go without giving them another meal to take with them. And I, I just thought, these Turkish people are incredible. And our students began to ask the question, why bring the Adventist message to them? 
You know, I mean, they were better Christians than we were. They were kinder and gentler and all the rest of that. So the question was real. And a little while after this, Elder Robert Falkenberg, who was president of the General Conference at the time, came and visited our little compound in Jerusalem. And he graciously agreed to answer a few questions of the students afterward. You know what the first question was? You guessed it. The people in Turkey are so nice, so kind, so charitable, and we were such a miserable louts. What do we have to give them? Why should we take the message to Turkey? Why should we change them? We're the ones that need changing. You know what Elder Falkenberg's answer was? One sentence. He said, we are a people of prophecy. If we could have the, uh, the picture once more. We are a prophetic movement. We are not a special people because we're kinder than other people. That would be nice, but that's not the essence of what makes an Adventist. We're not a special people because we're gentler, because we're better Christians, have a better relationship with Jesus. All of that would be good, but that's not the defining mark. The defining mark of the Seventh-day Adventist movement is that we have been called for a special moment in history, a time when things will not be as they seem to be. That is what we were called for, to be a prophetic movement. Yesterday I had an opportunity to gaze momentarily at the Tasman Sea off of your west coast here. And if you've ever stood on one of the hills overlooking the Tasman Sea, I think it's pretty obvious looking out there that the world is flat, don't you think? That's the way it looks. Looks perfectly flat. But things are not always as they seem to be. When my oldest daughter was about two and a half years old, we bought our first house, and it happens to be our only house so far. And uh, she had never seen us in all the years that she'd been alive, two and a half, mowing the lawn. Now, she had seen Daddy vacuuming the house, believe it or not. And so she was standing on the back deck of the house watching me going back and forth on the lawn. And this was an electric mower that we'd inherited with the house. So it had this long cord and, and you know, it had sort of a hum. And you go back and forth and you try to be careful not to run over the cord, you know. I did that plenty of times. And uh, going back and forth, she's looking at this, trying to figure out, what is he doing? And suddenly she got it. She ran into the house. She says, Mommy, guess what? Daddy's cleaning the grass. <laughs> no more bugs. <laughs> anyway, so uh, basically the message there is that things are not always what they seem. And the message of the book of Revelation which I'd like to talk about this morning, is to alert the world that in the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. Now, that's a fascinating piece of information. Because if you're under 30, you've probably heard of the Matrix. I don't know if you can see it too well there, but the question, if I can read it, is, did the Matrix get it right? You see, the fascinating thing in today's world is young people have come to believe in the possibility that everything you and I experience is somehow a lie. That somehow everything we see here could be some giant computer program and we're just kind of stuck in the program. Now that may sound silly if you're over 50, but the reality is that culture today is catching up with the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation taught that in the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem. And we look at the foundation passage here, Revelation 12 through 14, where we see that things are not always as they seem to be. You'll see three rectangles here representing Revelation 12, Revelation 13, and Revelation 14. So if you think of those three chapters kind of like, like a box, uh, that will help us going in. So I want to start you with Revelation 12 
and particularly the passage in verse 17 that we will see here. It says, The dragon was angry with the woman, and he went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So in a nutshell, this verse summarizes the final battle of earth's history, the final events of earth's history in just one little snippet there. And you'll see here that that battle has the dragon against the remnant. That's what it's all about. The dragon is at war with the remnant. So there's two sides in this final conflict. And the interesting thing is that Revelation 12, 7 sets the introduction for Revelation 13 and 14. Revelation 12, 17 here describes the whole battle in a nutshell. First of all, the dragon's side of the battle is what Revelation 13 is all about. So when you study Revelation 13, you're studying what the dragon will do in the last days of earth's history. And then, if you look at chapter 14, you will study what the remnant will do in the final crisis of earth's history. And you're all familiar with the three angels' messages. So Revelation 12 through 14 gives us the entire summary of what's going to take place at the end of time. And I would like to suggest that the message of these chapters is things will not be as they seem to be. Now, it told us in the text that the dragon will go away to make war. That sounds a little strange. Normally, if I want to make war with somebody, I would walk right up to them and punch him right in the nose, don't you think? That's not what the dragon does. The dragon goes away to make war. Now, why does the dragon do that? Where does he go? He goes to the beach. Maybe he's a Kiwi. I don't know. He goes to the beach. For what purpose? He goes to the beach to gather allies for the final conflict. You see, the dragon has been around for some time. And if you read Revelation 13, you will see that the dragon has attacked uh, the stars of heaven, has attacked the male child, has attacked the woman and so forth, all these symbols in Revelation 12. And now he's facing the final crisis of earth's history and he needs help. And so he goes to find allies for the final crisis. Revelation 13, it says, He, the dragon, stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So we see the dragon goes to get a couple of allies. There's the sea beast in verses 1 through 10, and then there's the land beast in verses 11 and 18. So the dragon goes to get some help. The dragon is joined by the sea beast, and then he's joined by the land beast. So what do you have? How many do you have? Three. An unholy three. You have the dragon, you have the sea beast, and you have the land beast. Now think about that for a moment. Could this be a counterfeit trinity? Is that why you have three here? Does the dragon perhaps represent God the Father and the sea beast represent God the Son and the land beast represent the Holy Spirit? Is that what's going on here? Is it trying to tell us that in the last days of earth's history it'll be hard to tell who the real God is? Or will the real God please stand up? Let's take a look at this. Don't take my word for it. Let's have a look at the text and see what in fact is going on. First of all, the dragon is the one who is the authority here and he gives his authority to the others. So the dragon's sort of the head of all of this. He's the one that brought the other two together. So the dragon would seem to be a counterfeit of God the Father. But then let's take a look at the sea beast. In Revelation 13, 1 to 5, it says of the sea beast that he had ten horns and seven heads. I didn't notice any of these in the cowrie forest yesterday, but we'll have to give some further thought to who these are. It says he had ten horns and seven heads. It says the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. 
And one of his heads was, as it were, slaughtered to death. And the wound of his death was healed. And the beast was given authority to act for 42 months. So we have a description here of a beast from the sea with ten horns and seven heads, lots of authority, slaughtered to death, and then healed. Now, if somebody slaughtered to death, what would you call the healing? Resurrection. Hmm. Something to think about. And he has authority to act for 42 months. All right? I'd like to suggest that the sea beast is a deliberate counterfeit of Jesus Christ. For example, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now let's just take for a moment that you're visiting the Cowrie Forest with me. And as we're walking through the forest, we discover an animal staring at us that has seven heads and ten horns. What would you know? You'd know that you've been drinking. But if you see five or six animals with seven heads and ten horns, what would you know? You found a species, a new species. This beast has seven heads and ten horns. Who else has seven heads and ten horns? The dragon. So the beast looks just like the dragon. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. The dragon gives all authority to who? The sea beast. Not only that, this beast has a death and a resurrection. If you compare verse 3 with verse 8, you'll see that the death of the beast is a deliberate counterfeit of the death of Jesus Christ. This sea beast has a death and a resurrection, just like Jesus. And guess what? It has a ministry of 42 months. How long is that? Three and a half years. How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years. The sea beast of Revelation 13 is a deliberate counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Let's have a look at the land beast that comes up at the end of chapter 13. The land beast has a number of characteristics. It has two horns like a lamb. It exercises the authority of the first beast in his behalf, or in his place, and he causes fire to come down from heaven to earth. Now, what does this remind you of? It reminds me of the Holy Spirit. Because first of all, the Holy Spirit is another comforter, if you know your Bible. The Holy Spirit is not the comforter. Who is the comforter? Jesus is. You see, in John chapter 14 through 16, Jesus is about to leave his disciples behind. And they're all depressed because they don't want to lose Jesus. And uh, Jesus says to them, don't be depressed. Don't feel like orphans. I will send the comforter to you. And the comforter will do for you what I used to do. So the Holy Spirit comes to replace the work of Jesus with his disciples. He is like the lamb. And here we see that the, uh, the land beast is like a lamb. It is like Jesus, just as the Holy Spirit was. And Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, He will not speak of Himself, but He will testify of Me. Do you remember what the land beast does? The land beast doesn't claim authority for himself. He points to the sea beast as the one that people should worship. So you see, the land beast does the same kind of things the Holy Spirit does. And by the way, did the Holy Spirit ever bring fire from heaven? At Pentecost. And this land beast brings fire down from heaven to earth. In the final days of earth's history, things will not be as they seem. There will be a Jesus figure that is not really Jesus. There will be a Holy Spirit figure that is not really the Holy Spirit. There'll be a Pentecost that isn't another Pentecost. In the last days of earth's history, things will not be as they seem. 
Is that a little frightening to you? It concerns me as I think about it. As we approach the last days of earth's history, the Bible tells us that things will not be as they seem. If you want to use young people's language today, John presents an apocalyptic matrix. A situation in which the vast majority of the people on earth are totally oblivious to what's really going on. What is the role of God's Advent people? It is to be a prophetic movement that helps the world to see what God is doing in a time when things are not as they seem to be. How to prepare? What can we do to be ready for such a time of deception? I'd like to suggest three things. A renewed devotion to Bible study. The Bible is filled with information that will help us to be ready for whatever comes. Some of you may have been familiar with what I'm sharing with, uh, from Revelation. Many of you may never have heard such a thing before. It was there, you see. But as we study the Bible more carefully and more deeply, God will open up to us truths that will help us to prepare for the final events. I suggest a renewed devotion to prayer. To pray as we've never prayed before, realizing that we too <coughs> could be deceived. And finally, a distrust of self and one's own opinions. One of the reasons why people are easily deceived is that people tend to trust anything that sounds like what they already believe. New ideas tend to be very frightening to most people. And the reality is God is saying at the end of time, people are going to get what they want. People are going to be allowed to believe what they have wanted to believe. And as a result, we need to be careful to distrust ourselves, distrust our own opinions, because God may be eager to teach us what we need to know as we approach the end. And yet if we're not willing to learn, then we cannot be prepared for the events that are coming. What is the nature of the deception? It says, He performed great signs in order that He might cause fire to come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men. And He deceives those who live on the earth through the signs He was given to perform before the beast. How will the deception take place? It will take place through mighty, miraculous acts. You know, many people say, if only God would do miracles like He used to. You know what would happen? If there were more miracles, there would probably be more confusion. In the last days of earth's history, miracles will be the basis for deceiving people. People will see the miracles and say, hey, that looks like Jesus when he was on this earth. This must be the work of God. And the reality is at the end of time, some of the great miracles that take place will actually be in support of a counterfeit trinity. Now... Let me share with you just quickly uh, an item regarding uh, how you study the Bible. Because one of the things that has always concerned me, and perhaps it's concerned you too, is when people get up to preach and they jump from one Bible text to another, and you begin to say, now why'd they put those two texts together? Why are we jumping from here to here? Do you realize that you can, by jumping from one text to another, prove anything you want? You all remember the story about the fellow who tossed his Bible down? put his finger on it to get a word from the Lord, and what did it say? Judas went out and hanged himself. That didn't sound very encouraging, so he dropped the Bible again, put his finger on it, and said, Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> now this was not going where the young man wanted to go, so he did it a third time, threw the Bible down, put his finger, and it says, What thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> and the point of that silly story is this. If you're minded to do so, you can make the Bible say anything you want. And so it is imperative that when we're studying the Bible, that we compare words, phrases, sentences, and ideas that are on the same subject and use the same language. See those two principles? Same subject, same language. When you do that, you discover that there are four texts in the New Testament that talk about the end time deception. We won't have time to look at them all today. but there are two other passages on end-time deception besides Revelation 13. 2 Thessalonians 2 
verses 8 to 12, and Matthew 24, verses 23 to 27. So if you have some time this afternoon, take a look at 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, and you'll learn some more about the end time deception. But I want to take you to the fourth text now, and that's Revelation 16. One further passage on end time deception. Revelation 16, 13. Now, check me out. Don't let me carry you from passage to passage. You can deceive people that way. Is this text relevant to the subject? I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits that look like frogs. Who are these? The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Who are they? The same three characters we saw in Revelation 13. You had there the dragon, beast, and false prophet. Here you have dragon, you have sea beast, and you have land beast. Do you see the connection? You have three characters. The first is the dragon, the second is called the beast, the third is called the beast from the earth, the false prophet. So you have the same subject, and it's even using the same language to describe these two groups of three. You're in the same ballpark in chapter 16 that you were in in chapter 13. You're talking about the same deception as chapter 13. Well, let's see what we can learn about this deception. I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet three unclean spirits that looked like frogs. It raises the question to me, why frogs? Why in the book of Revelation do you have frogs all of a sudden? Any idea? has to do with the story of the Exodus. Revelation 16 is built on the story of the Exodus. And do you remember what the frogs had to do with that? The frogs in the Exodus story were one of the ten plagues. In Revelation chapter 16, you have the seven last plagues. And they are built on the plagues of Moses. They remind us of Pharaoh's magicians. What did Pharaoh's magicians want to do? They wanted to deceive Pharaoh as to who is the true God. Is it the gods of Egypt or is it the God of Israel? That was the issue there. And what did the magicians do? When Moses turned a stick into a snake, what did Pharaoh's magicians do? Turned their own sticks into snakes. When Moses turned water into blood, what did they do? Turn water into blood. When Moses produced frogs, what did they do? They produced frogs. I don't know how you could tell if there were millions already, but somehow Pharaoh believed that they had produced frogs. You know what's the interesting part of the story? <clears throat> the frogs were the last deception in ancient Egypt. They were allowed to counterfeit several of God's actions, and then God put a stop to it. The frogs of the Exodus were the last deception permitted by God. And that's why frogs are in Revelation 13. This is the last deception of earth's history. I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet three unclean spirits that looked like frogs, <clears throat> for they are the spirits of demons. Obviously the red isn't working too well. So we'll try to change that in future presentations. But these frogs represent the spirits of demons. What is a demon? Evil angel, a fallen angel. So you have three fallen angels. Doing what? Going out to the kings of the whole inhabited world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Is this the only group of three angels in the book? In chapter 14... You had God's three angels going out to the whole world to do what? Preach the everlasting gospel. Here you have three demonic angels going out to the whole world, and what are they doing? They are preaching the devil's gospel. It looks like the true gospel. It sounds like the true gospel. It goes to the whole world. But what? It is a counterfeit gospel. You have a counterfeit of the true God, 
and you have a counterfeit of the true gospel. According to the book of Revelation, in the last days of earth's history, just because something sounds Christian doesn't make it biblical. The sad message is that in the last days of earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. There'll be two competing claims to truth. But it gets even worse than this. A terrible deception to not be sure who God is or what side God is on, not be sure what the gospel is, but it gets even worse than this. Let's have a look at one more text in verse 16. He gathered them to the place that is called in Hebrew, Armageddon. It's the famous battle of Armageddon. Let's take a closer look at this word, Armageddon. It's a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word har means mountain. And the Hebrew word, actually the Greek word mageddon, translates the Hebrew word megiddo. So what you have here is actually the mountain of megiddo. And you say, so what? I don't care anything about Megiddo. What do I care about some mountain called Megiddo? But you know what's the interesting thing here? There is no mountain of Megiddo anywhere in the world. So what's going on? What kind of symbol is this? Actually, ancient Megiddo was a city at the edge of a large valley. And if you ever have a chance to visit Israel, go visit Megiddo. And when you're standing in Megiddo, in the ruins of ancient Megiddo, and you look up, you will see a mountain. It actually comes to a point. A mountain that is looming over Megiddo. The mountain of Megiddo. Do you know what the name of that mountain is? It's Mount Carmel. What do we know about Mount Carmel? Mount Carmel is the place where Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. He had a showdown. Do you remember in that circumstance, it wasn't clear who the true God was? It wasn't clear who the true message was? And how did God resolve that problem with Elijah? When the issue was competing claims to God, the issue was settled by fire from heaven. Do you remember that? You could know who the true God was in Elijah's day when the fire came from heaven. Now, you remember I said the deception gets even worse? Come back with me to Revelation 13. Because there's one big difference this time. And that difference is this. He performed great signs. Who is he? The counterfeit Holy Spirit. Performed great signs in order that he might cause fire to come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men. What's the purpose of that fire? To deceive the people who are on earth. The book of Revelation teaches that the end time deception will be so severe that the Mount Carmel experience will be reconstructed. The whole world will be brought to a decision. The whole world will be aware of two choices for who to worship. The whole world will be aware of two gospels to be received. And the showdown will be decided by fire from heaven. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that it'll be literal Mount Carmel or even literal fire. I don't know exactly how that deception will take place. If you read the book Great Controversy, it gives you some hints. But this I know. In the last days of earth's history, what your eyes see, what your ears hear, and what you can touch... Reality will be a matrix. It will be a deception. It will be the opposite of the real truth. That's something our young people are prepared for these days. The fire will fall on the wrong altar. Are we prepared? Are we prepared when everything that makes sense to us will be seen to be a deception of one kind or another? What we see here is a secular trap. According to some surveys, you may disagree with me on that, and I don't know, this is just what I've heard. 
According to some surveys, the two most secular countries in the world are Sweden and New Zealand. And if that is the case, Kiwis are particularly set up for the end time deception. Because what is a secular belief? The basic belief of secularism is that all I can trust is what? What I can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. That's all I can trust. The five senses. That's reality. That's the basic belief system of secularism. I live in the real world. I trust in the five senses. But what does the Bible teach? In the last days of earth's history, the five senses will deceive us. And the truth will be found somewhere else. Where? In the Word of God. So what is Adventist identity? What is it that makes us who we are? And what difference does it make? It is this. We are a people of prophecy. We are the ones who have recognized in the book of Revelation some of the things that we'll be talking about this week. And I'll be sharing with you night after night material from the book of Revelation and other places in the Bible that will unpack and clarify the issues that I'm just introducing to you this morning. I hope that you can be here uh, for each of those. But we are a people of prophecy. God has called us to give a message. You know that I had the chance to present some of the things you're seeing here to the leaders of the Lutheran World Federation in Switzerland. And they took a look at a lot of this and they said, well, this is not what Lutherans teach. Now, how would you answer? Well, in that circumstance, I answered in this way, given the gravity of the situation and who it was that was talking to who. And I said to them, all right, these aren't things that Luther taught. And you may not agree with the way that we read Revelation. But if I am right, and there's a great end-time deception coming upon the world, then only those who have understood this message will be able to prepare people for that. And if we're not going to give the message, who's going to give it? You aren't. And I invited them to consider Adventists a partner in preparing the world because of the unique message that God has given us. If we don't give it, nobody out there is going to give it for us. This is a unique role, a special purpose that God has laid out for us to warn the world that in the last days of earth's history, things will not be as they seem. Lutherans aren't teaching that. Catholics aren't teaching that. Methodists aren't teaching that. This is a message that God has given us. It is the unique role and the unique ministry of Adventists to warn the world that those who trust in the five senses will be deceived. The only safeguard is reliance on the Word of God. What's the only way to know the Word of God? Is to study it. You cannot know the Word, you cannot rely on the Word, excuse me, if you do not know the Word. And I invite you this morning to rededicate yourselves to a renewed study of Scripture, to open the Word of God. And uh, for those of you who want to know how, one tool that I can recommend is, is shortly to be published by Review and Herald, an insider's guide to the book of Revelation. Does that sound like fun? Uh, the title I've given it is The Deep Things of God. You may want to watch for it next year sometime. What it'll do is simply take you step by step how you go about studying the book of Revelation to discover the kinds of things that we're covering this week. But don't wait for that. I would encourage you to dedicate yourself now to spend some time every day to understanding the Word of God for yourself. My prayer for you here in New Zealand is that this camp meeting will the beginning of a new day for the church in this place. Perhaps this is one of the most secular countries on earth, but God loves secular people. God wants secular people to know his word too. May God be with us as we take up the identity, the destiny to which he has called us.